just my minimal knowledge of all of this, if I had to throw a, a dart on the map, I would put it in that same area. You know, it's going to be closer to the destination than the departure area. It's the 4th of July in 1977. John and Jean Block board their 1969 white and green single engine Cessna 150J in preparation to fly from a small airport in Macomb, Michigan to the Lost Creek Sky Ranch Airport in Luzerne, Michigan. Their approximate departure was 11.05 a.m. Their approximate arrival would have been between early and mid-afternoon. Sadly, John and Jean Block never landed at Lost Creek Sky Ranch in Luzerne, Michigan, and to this day, there has not been a credible sighting of John and Jean Block or their 1969 Cessna aircraft. Join us as we dive deep into the case and examine the facts. Follow us as we embark on pinpointed searches through Michigan's desolate swamps and vast forest. At the very least, help us spread the word of John and Jean Block so that their memory remains not forgotten. Hey guys, welcome back to Not Forgotten. Uh, on this episode, we sit down and interview a gentleman named uh, Wayne Lusardi. Uh, he is a maritime archaeologist for the state of Michigan. Uh, he sat down with us and gave us his insight on the John and Jean Block case and their, uh, their missing Cessna. So enjoy the episode, guys. Thanks a lot. So cool. Um, Wayne, I don't know. Do you want to tell us, like, just, I don't know if, I think everybody here has an idea, but do you just want to give us an idea of who you are and kind of what you do and stuff? Yeah, sure thing. So I'm Wayne Lusardi. I am the state of Michigan's maritime archaeologist. So most of my work is underwater around the Great Lakes. As you know, there are something like 1,500 shipwrecks in lake in uh, lakes around Michigan. Um, but there are a whole lot of other cultural resources. There are paleo landscapes where people people hunted and chased caribou around 8,000 years ago that are now inundated. There are piers and wharves and docks and those kinds of structures. And there are a lot of airplanes. And the uh, airplane research is pretty new to me. I've only been doing it for about seven years. Mostly it's, uh, I guess, an after work hobby. Uh, though I've been able to do some airplane projects for work. There are a number of historic aircraft sites that have been found in Michigan, both on land and in the water. And as an archaeologist, I want to document them as best I can. I'm in the process of recovering a World War II airplane that was flown by a Tuskegee Airmen that crashed in Lake Huron in 1944 uh, in conjunction with the National Museum of the Tuskegee Airmen down in Detroit. Uh, I am an artifact conservator and curator for all the Michigan's shipwreck archaeological collections that's housed here in Alpena. I'm based in Alpena at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And so I work for the Department of Natural Resources, but I work out of a federal office here in Alpena. And I've been here going on 20 years now. I'm pretty so, familiar with Alpena. I used to live in uh, Roger City, so. Did you? All right. That's yeah. funny. Everybody used to live in Roger City. My, <laughs> yeah. my, my daughter is down at U of M. Uh, she's an aerospace uh, engineer student there. And nobody heard of Alpena in Ann Arbor, but everybody knows where Roger City is because they wow. used to live there or they went there for vacations or whatever. I don't, I don't know what it is. So. That's rare. Cause if you blink, you'll miss it. That's, that's right. <laughs> anyway. So I, you know, I've been super fascinated <coughs> with, uh, not just this case, but with a lot of missing aircraft around the lakes. And, uh, again, my primary focus is in the water. Uh, all of, most of my tools of the trade are for water related searches, you know, like side scan sonar and magnetometers and things like that. But there's so much technology now that can really go either way, both on land searching and uh, in water searching that uh, it's, it's come a long way in the last 50 years, that's for sure, even the last 10 years. So i uh, super interested and, uh, and excited to be uh, of help in any capacity that I can be. Yeah, obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of focused on the, or not kind of focused, we're really focused on the, uh, the John and the Gene Block, you know, the 1977, and there's the Cessna. Um, what, how'd you get involved with that? Like, how'd that come to be? How, is that something you just stumbled across? Or, Well, you know, when I first got to Alpena, I started a database. I like databases. I like to kind of manage that information. And I started one on shipwrecks. Uh, that are in Thunder Bay and what what is known and what is potentially out there. 
and that just started growing and it populated and you know there are again about 1500 known shipwrecks in Michigan waters and and another who knows how many that that could be sunk out there and it never really occurred to me that there could be a airplanes out in the lake. I don't know why. It was just kind of this one thing. I just didn't think about it very much. And I was contacted by a family member of a guy that uh, his dad was killed in an aircraft accident coming in from Manitoulin Island to Alpena in 1966. And he asked me if we'd ever found a plane. And I was like, well, we never even looked for the plane. And so anyway, I stuck that plane into the database. And then as that interest grew and as I became more and more aware of other airplane and aircraft accidents in the lakes, I kind of separated them out and I built its own data set. And I have something like 1100 aircraft accidents in the Great Lakes now. So, I mean, it's pretty crazy from everything from 19th century hot air and hydrogen balloons to Russian Sputnik satellites to rockets off the Keweenaw to, you know, all kinds of things in between a lot of military aircraft. You know, Lake Michigan's got 140 or so Navy aircraft that were lost during carrier calls there. The oh. Tuskegee Airmen, there were 15 Tuskegee Airmen that were killed here in Michigan, uh, mostly in Lake Huron. There were about a dozen free French that were killed in Lake Huron plane crashes. Um, so the, that that information just kept on building and building. And of course, I came across, you know, information regarding this missing Cessna from 77. Um, just recently, earlier this year, I talked with John uh, block and and he provided me with a bunch of information he sent me this this very famous book now and um you know so and he, he kind of shared what he knew and where it kind of left off and and what he hopes for and uh you know so i i don't have a lot of extra information particularly on this um most of my uh, initial information comes from newspaper articles and archives that sort of thing and then i try to delve deeper and try to get the accident reports if they're military aircraft i try to get the ntsb or faa reports if they're civilian or commercial uh you know i'm just trying to get as much information on each one of these and so uh you know the block cesta is just kind of one one in a thousand literally so yeah. that I'm, I'm interested in and so um obviously it's it's it's, it, it's a higher pr a priority because um, you know you have living family members that are still searching. They still want answers. Absolutely. And it's been amazing over the course of the last seven years since I started all of this, how many family members have contacted me uh, regarding their, their dad's missing, their brother's missing, their uncle's missing. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. So, um, you know, I've worked with uh, members from the deeper the defense uh, POW MIA accounting office. They're obviously interested in military aviation accidents, uh, but they their focus, their mission is not on civilian or on uh, training accidents. And so all of their work is overseas. It's, it's looking for MIAs in active war zones or, or previous war zones. And um, that's not to say that they're not interested in training losses, but it's just not part of their mission. So it's pretty minimal. Uh, governmental assistance from that from the federal government anyway or from DOD. Um, that all said, uh, there are a lot of organizations that are out there that are doing this uh, on their own time and their own dime and there are a lot of people that are searching around Michigan for various aircraft and and their flight crews. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah in, in relation to that that case we, we kind of uh, uh, followed the same path in a way where we kind of got in touch with well, <laughs> It was a lot of people getting in touch with a lot of the different people and we kind of grew this web and then talked to John and then it leads to this and that and then before you know it, you're talking to a whole bunch of people but uh, we got a lot of information and documents from John and we got some information from the Traverse City Sheriff's Department and we're waiting on documents from other entities like that um, you know via FOIA requests and things like that but one of the one of the things that we do have is that kind of the the book or the report or I don't know what you call it but you know that you were you wrote quite an extensive uh, intensive piece piece of literature on the case and uh, I, I, I've read some of it. I've skimmed through some different parts and read some different parts. I didn't, I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't sit down and read it word for word, but I did, uh, uh skim through it and, and look at some different stuff. And it looked like the, the beginning of that book and the majority of it was about the weather that kind of that day or some different things about the weather. And initially in the beginning of this, that was something that we struggled with as well to try to determine what exactly the weather was, obviously, because it was so long ago. Um, we did know that the weather was, was pretty bad, but to our, what we believed it kind of maybe got, it was towards the end of the day that it got really, really bad. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of ask you how, 
um, the, just the weather information that you came up with. Is there any way you, you came about getting that information? Was that just like forecasts and some different things you discovered or was there other avenues you took? Or if you remember, I know, you know, it's not like super recent in your memory, but. The weather data that I'm, uh, that I've sort of ascertained, there's a, there's a, a method called hind casting. And you can look at their weather stations everywhere, all over the place. And they record weather on an hourly basis or whatever. And they're, and some of these can be quite historical back into the 19th century. Uh, the National Weather Service, a part of NOAA that is based out of Grand Rapids, has done a number of hind casts. And basically they're, they're putting weather into motion just like you would see on a Doppler radar kind of today, you know, when you're watching your, your seven and 10 news or whatever. And you can, you can see the weather shift. You can see the fronts coming across. You can see what the temperatures are, what the pressure is and that sort of thing. And so you have all these data sets by the, by the thousands all over just Michigan that can be plugged into computer programs to show you a, a live sort of show of what was going on on a minute to minute basis from the time the blocks took off to the time they were supposed to have landed up near Mayo or Luzerne. So that information's out there. It's just a matter of crunching it and kind of putting it all together. And then what just, what did you generally um, kind of deduce or generally kind of come up with as far as a general idea of how the weather went through that day? Just, I think that if he left that, if he left when he was supposed to have left, I think that he could have gotten ahead of it. It, it seems like if there was any delay, then, you know, like you said before, it, it seemed like it got super severe through the evening, but he should have been, he should have been already there by then. And so I don't know how much he was affected by that. You know, there are, there are a lot of accounts of, you know, a beautiful 4th of July day in various places around Michigan and the shit didn't hit the fan until, you know, eight o'clock or so that evening. So right. I don't know. I think he could have gotten ahead of it if all went well. Now, if he was delayed for some reason, if he had to put down for some reason, and then even in a field, who, I mean, we just don't know whatever, whatever happened. Um, then the longer he would have delayed, the more likely he would have gotten into bad weather. But, you know, for the couple hours from 11 o'clock or whenever he took off in the morning, uh, he, he should have been clear of it, I would think. I think that's kind of what we kind of came up with yeah. as far as that. I think the only thing that we kind of maybe got a little more information on was visibility as far as him being a VFR pilot. And and I don't know if Patrick, yeah. if you want to expound on that, because you, you're kind of you were kind of our liaison on getting that information. But um, yeah, we, we can do that. So, Wayne, my name is Patrick Richardson. I'm a commercial pilot and flight instructor at Grand Rapids. Right. And so. Uh, I dug fairly heavily into a lot of that weather information and went back to um, the NOAA website and pulled, I guess it was eight or 10 different reporting stations. And I pulled the weather for the 24 hours during that 4th of July day, the 24 hours before and the 24 hours after. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say what you said, because that's almost exactly what I came up with when I reconstructed it that it was really hot, it was really humid. Um, the flight visibility, even though the ground visibility was probably 10 miles, uh, reported as 10 miles, the flight visibility was probably quite poor. So I also don't think that he really would have hit any precipitation until later on in the late afternoon, early evening hours, maybe five to six o'clock, seven o'clock, something like that. That was something that we really struggled with, um, you know, in the beginning, I think until we were able to put it all together and then to have you kind of corroborate that, that's that's very helpful. Yeah, it kind of took us a little bit to figure it out too. I think it was about a good week or so, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, By the time we probably, deciphered everything. and Probably longer than that. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't a whole whole lot of information. I mean, there was, but you had to really dig for it. It wasn't, it wasn't you couldn't yeah. go on weather.com and search a date and find it and all laid out for you, <laughs> yeah. for sure. You can all, you can almost do that now. This. Almost, yeah. You can, almost, you, can, yeah. you can get you started for sure, yeah. 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 Hey, uh, one thing I want to ask you, Wayne, because I think this is kind of your, the what I, my question relates to kind of your specialty in a sense as far as water goes. Um so as, as a group for us, 
given the research we've done so far and <laughs> it seems like we have a theory or an idea and then tomorrow it's different just because we spin around in circles or get new information or whatever but I think we're as a group we're under the general consensus that the plane is probably in a and of there's one of two two places a very very remote part of the woods that is not heavily traveled that hunters or other people wouldn't travel to for various reasons or it's in a swampy marshy wetland that people wouldn't travel to and that could also have the ability to keep the plane hit them for hidden uh, for a long period of time. And so, and just yeah. to go into a little bit of kind of our method to kind of lead up to my question is what we've been doing um, as a group. Well, first we did a lot of information gathering, which we're still doing every day, but the, our, the majority of our, our energy and our effort is to actually searching for the plane at this point. Um, and how we're doing that is we're kind of starting our search on um, Google Earth Pro. Um, it's not, it's, it sounds like a real, you know, play playground, you know, kids type of tool, but if you know how to use it, it can be kind of helpful in what we're doing. Um, Cause what you can do is you can look at certain, you probably have been on it before, but just for people listening or whoever, but you can, you can look at certain parts of the, wherever you're looking at and you can change the years and you can change it to fall and see leaves off the trees. You can see what the terrain looked like back in the nineties, as opposed to now and what's been cut and what has it. And it gives you an idea of what the terrain just differences, but we've actually found, um, Air, other aircraft crashes on Google Earth. Well, we didn't find them like we stumbled on them. We knew they were there. And then we went and actually found them on Google Earth to see if we could see them. And, and, yeah. we, could, and we could. So with that information, we got on, we, we're basically trying to recreate that with a plane we haven't found. We're trying to see if we can find the plane and using what we've already found as a point of reference. I think Patrick is actually showing you an example. Yeah. My yeah, question. I, think this, uh, I thought I think I saw this on a uh, YouTube or something video oh. that you had up online. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> good. I'm, I'm glad somebody's watching. Uh, <laughs> um, my question, though, I'm going to lead up to is kind of as far as searching swamps, because that's kind of something that we got to kind of figure out how to do efficiently. Um, we've we've yeah. thrown around the idea of a magnetometer, but obviously those are expensive, and you got you could probably rent them, or we don't know a lot, so we're, I'm just kind of talking out of my rear end right now. But yeah. magnetometer, I'm waiting for water to freeze so you can actually walk on it and search it some way in that shape or form. So it's kind of a, a thing I wanted to ask you. Um, as just kind of different methods that we could use or someone could use to try to search for a large, you know, like a plane or something in, in a swamp. Yeah, uh, it ain't easy. So, uh, I, um, you know, like, you know, not to be a naysayer, but like my kids have a little sledding hill in our backwoods and we left an aluminum saucer there one winter, just upside down. And by <laughs> spring, the thing was covered in a half a foot of pine needles and moss and sticks and everything else. It was gone. Like it was just absorbed into the earth. And, and so it doesn't take very long to kind of mask this stuff. One of the sites that I've worked and documented a lot of is a KC-135 strato tanker that was coming down from Kinchley, uh, going into Wordsmith, uh, Oscoda, about almost 50 years ago. And it crashed just southeast or southwest of Alpena. Um, large loss of life, 15 guys uh, on board were killed, five survivors. But the plane was a big plane. I mean, it's a KC-135, it's a pretty big aircraft. And it was shredded through the woods. And if you want, and it's all cedar swamp right now. So kind of the same sort of scenario. You can go there, you might see a little piece of aluminum sticking up that's like three or four by inches by five inches and start tugging on it. All of a sudden you got 40 feet of a piece of wing that's there that, was, that you didn't even know was there. You only just saw this little bit of it. And so it gets, it gets absorbed very, very quickly. So yeah, not to interrupt you, but just off yeah. of what you just said, um, we were, we, we did one, an actually, we did two physical searches and the last physical search we did, and maybe you've seen this if you watch our YouTube, but we found this old white suitcase. That's probably not, yeah. that's probably not related to the case whatsoever. It was just cool right, to find right, something right. like that, but it was a similar that's situation where it was a yeah. similar situation where Jenny Black saw this little white thing that, and yeah. it was like, you know, six inches long, she grabbed it. And just kept yanking on it. And then eventually we dug yeah. up a whole suitcase and I it's half like the wardrobe. scarves out of a magician. Yeah. 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 Just to go yeah. to what you were saying, you know, it was something. buried in pine needles and just debris. Yeah. And, 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 it, was and it happened immediately. I mean, for as amount of times that you clean off your roofs and, you know, so 
So not to say that aerial imagery is not the way to do it, but it's definitely, you got to have a lot of luck if you're going to find something that way. Um, magnetometers detect interferences in the Earth's magnetism, and that's caused by iron objects. And obviously aircraft, uh, you know, there are iron components on it, the, the engine, the landing gears, that's kind of it. And the rest of it is aluminum. So you're not going to find that with a, a traditional magnetometer. Uh, you more like to find it with a metal detector that could pick up all kinds of metals. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've been looking at is doing aerial surveys. Uh, there is some public release of satellite infrared data. And as you can imagine, metal that's laying on the ground is going to absorb and reflect heat differently than it's than dirt and, and grass and other kinds of things. And depending on how heated or how different that temperature is and how big that piece of metal is, you can see that either from satellites or from drone equipped with uh, infrared technology. And so that's something I'm looking at working with a university downstate to see if we can do uh, some of these known aircraft wreck sites and kind of do a survey over those with a drone and then just kind of see then if we can kind of reflect that and just go fly off into the distance and see if we can detect other kind mm -hmm. of metal sources along the ground there. Um, yeah. Obviously, you're going to have optimal conditions when there's not a lot of leaves on the trees, but not a lot of leaves on the ground and not a lot of water on the ground. And so you never really get all those perfect conditions in Michigan, I don't think, uh, particularly in this kind of presumed flight path area. You know, you got a lot of big open areas and uh, and a lot of swamp areas and a lot of water areas in the spring. And so it's going to be tough. Um, yeah. The other thing I'm looking at is using GIS. There are a number of GIS data sets uh, where you can map out the presumed flight path between, you know, um, Macomb County and uh, Oscoda County, Iosco County. Um, and then you can take a look at uh, forestry kind of uh, sales of timber and that sort of thing. And you can hope, and you, you, you can't be absolutely sure, but you can hope that if there was a prescribed cut or a clear cut in some area, that aluminum would have been found or a wreckage would have been found and identified. Um, you don't know that for sure. And when I find junk in the woods, my first thought is it's just junk in the woods. You know, it's a part of a deer blind. It's part of a bait barrel, that kind of thing. And right. a lot of folks may have seen something like this already and just misidentified it. Who knows? Yeah, it just depends on how married it is. Um, but if you if you can take out all of the urbanized areas, you can take out all the highways, you can take out all of the agricultural areas, that sort of thing with GIS, then you can really start to narrow down the box. And when I do searches on the water, obviously, you want the box before you get on a boat, you want that box to be as absolutely small as possible. And that means you have to spend a lot more time doing research working in the library than you actually out on the water and, and you got to get that it otherwise it's a needle in a haystack and so the smaller uh the the more thorough historic research the better you're going to be to conduct a search now what we got here is i don't i don't know if you got more information than what i've seen or or probably the same i, I don't know uh, but there's not a lot to go on you know you know the characteristics of the aircraft you know where it was leaving from at least initially you're presuming that it didn't touch down and refuel anywhere en route you know what its ultimate range was on a full tank of gas uh if it if it did go at its full range i mean that could literally put it in any one of the great lakes uh you know depending yeah. on what direction it went and i i don't want to say it's in kentucky but it could reach kentucky it could yeah it could be past and the Great Lakes. <laughs> so, yeah, and it could literally go in all of the Great Lakes uh, in the in their entirety almost, except for a little bit of Lake Superior, I think. So with what's a 150, he's got a 420-mile range thereabouts. So I, I don't know. You know, with no eyewitnesses, with no credible sources, um, what what's the deal with the whole Charlotte uh, <laughs> connection? So John, you know, kind of talked to me about that a little bit and, and gave me his sort of opinion about it. But, you know, is that sort of an officially off the off the table now or, or what do you guys think? I don't uh, think it's officially off the table, but it, it's probably is off the table, but you just never know. I mean, that's just me. These guys all probably have different uh theories on that yeah we could we could probably have a separate three hour talk on just charlotte and if he went there or not just because it's yeah. it's such a, a circle but um what one thing that i discovered 
um, is that a Michigan State Trooper actually interviewed the folks that intro- that he interviewed them as, as well. Um, I, 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 it's it, it's in the Traverse City interview. It's in, but we got a FOIA request forms from Traverse City, and it's in their uh, their uh, witnesses that that okay. sh- that deputy or I think it was a sergeant actually for the Michigan State Police interviewed these folks. Yep. And I thought that was yeah, interesting. Was- I thought that was interesting because it, it, it's more than one person tell you know to account for something that happened. So I put a request out to them to see if I could get any information on that. So we, we'll see. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't think I don't know. I don't. I don't. I couldn't even tell you what we think as a group as far as shall I, One day we'll say he didn't go there, and the next day we'll say, well, what if maybe this or that. Somebody tell him yeah. this whole story. Who remembers the whole story on that? Do you do you know what Pat Patrick about the whole Mike Black, those two witnesses, the airport? They said they seen him taken off, headed north. He left without refueling. What What do you got on that, Patrick? So initially. <clears throat> It's important to note that the information about the Charlotte uh, flight segment was discussed on the very last day of the search. And I think the theory is that uh, perhaps that information was divulged in order to keep the search going on. So uh, it, it seemed a little odd to put it kind of off track of the search you know it, it's sort of a big, pretty big zigzag out of the flight path i don't know the other thing that john was super adamant about was that his dad would not fly over water mm-hmm. so um you know if you if you draw a line from new haven to lost creek it's going right over saginaw bay and if there's a front coming through or pop-ups coming you know the weather uh, the weather that's official in Alpina, I live nine miles out of Alpina, and the official weather forecast and the official weather recording is infinitely different than where I live. And so the lakes, as you know, make their own weather. They do all kinds of funky things. And so um, maybe he did get into weather. Maybe he did go someplace that it was better visibility. Maybe he got pop-up thunderstorms that were happening down there that aren't recorded on the grand scale. Um, but in any case, uh, and, and maybe he didn't see, maybe he didn't see the ground at, at that time. And he didn't know exactly where he was. Uh, if he had a, a medical problem, um, then, then all bets are off. Then who knows what could have happened. Um, but I've been doing a lot of survey in, uh, in the mouth of uh, Saginaw Bay. There are quite a few aircraft that are missing down there. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that we, it, it's weird that you would think that there's so many airplanes in Saginaw Bay. Uh, you know, the depth is 10 meters, if that. Uh, so you would think they'd be pretty easy to find, but airplanes are tough to find. They're not big shipwrecks. They're not, uh, they blend, they break, and they blend into the bottom pretty quickly too. So uh, I've run sonar surveys over the top of airplanes that I know are there and you can barely see them. So it's mm. it's, it's tough going. So it, Again, we just got to narrow down that search area as best we can. Yeah, I, I think I think we think as a group that he's um, he's not you know, like he's he's north of like the Mount Pleasant that area because anything yeah. south of that is just too populated for him to be anywhere down there. And yeah. we, we 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 toss around Charlotte a lot that, that that he went there, not whatever. But a lot of times when we actually sit down and think about it, it is important. It is important to the case as far as. John's mental state, if he was really that lost, why he went there, that part of it's important, but, and Ross likes to, likes to say this a lot, but a lot of times when we're uh, nitpicking certain things about it, he'll say, well, does that really help us get closer to knowing where the plane's at? And when you think about, when you think about the Charlotte, as long as he did go north from Charlotte, it doesn't expand your search area all that much is it's, it just turns it into a triangle basically. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. so we're kind of yeah. under the impression that he, if, if we like our gut feeling is that he's within that triangle, you know, it's in somewhere remote, whether it be a forest swamp, I, 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 uh, I, I can see the water, the lakes. I can see that scenario, um, from what you're saying. And in my opinion, I think the, the only way for that to happen is if he was so lost that, like you said, he couldn't see, he didn't know what he was just flying blind in a way and then he had a medical emergency and went down over the lake on accident but i think for him to fly over one of the great lakes on purpose because he, he's his if 
he, his emotions are already heightened if he's having a bad day flying because he's lost or stressed or whatever. And then for him to then go over the lakes when he already knows he's not like, he wouldn't go over them if he's having a good day flying. So it would go over them with a bad day flying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think the yeah. only way, in my opinion, that, that that happens is if it's by accident. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I like to keep yeah, in Yeah. Two is um like, uh, it was the 4th of July weekend. <laughs> so, I mean, there's probably a lot of activity on some of these smaller lakes like Holton, Higgins, things like that. So. Yeah, and I, I don't know. If, Sorry, Jeff. We're me and Go Jeff ahead. are actually from Bay City. Uh, that's where we originally grew up. And Bay City has one hell of a fireworks show. And the Saginaw Bay mm -hmm. is like a madhouse. I don't know how it was in the seventies, but now yeah. it's like if you took a boat out and the, you, you'd have to stay the night in your boat because you or something. It's rough. <laughs> so that's that's one thing too to consider about some of the like. And I think about even like the larger lakes that are inland, like Holt, like a, like Torch Lake or Holton Lake or some of those bigger lakes that are more or Higgins Lake or something like that. And the Fourth of July, those have a lot of a lot of traffic. So you you would hope that if a plane went down, somebody would have seen something on one of those lakes. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but you know, you don't you know, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if I had to, just my minimal knowledge of all of this, if I had to throw a, a dart on the map, I would put it in that same area. You know, it's going to be closer to the destination than the departure area. Um, that he's in, a, he's in a just a heavily forested area. It hasn't been found. Or just was it identified as an aircraft? You know, it's just somebody may have seen some aluminum in the woods. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I got a guy here that found a, a, he claimed he has a deer blind that's made out of a canopy from a P-51 Mustang. And, uh, you know, he, talk, he talks a lot. He talks a lot and kind of lets me chase my tail around a lot of times. But uh, ultimately, I found that there was a P-51 Mustang, Air National Guard, Ohio Air National Guard, went into the lake and the guy jettisoned or, or bailed out and the canopy went. And sure enough, he's really got the canopy sitting in the wow. middle of the woods, you know, hmm. 10 miles from nowhere. Um, but so, it's, so sometimes these stories really pan out. Now, did he ever report it officially? No, did, you know, it was just kind of yeah. you know, raw material to, yeah. you know, put his deer blind together. So. And you're, and you're absolutely right. I mean, for us to be able to find this thing in, in the woods is going to take a significant amount of luck. You know, our, our biggest hope is that, like you said, planes are aluminum, which is, is bad for magnet, you know, trying to find it with a magnet or a metal detector or something, mm -hmm. but it's good for rusting and de and, 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 the, and it breaking down. It's going to, I don't, I, I don't believe from what we've seen of other crashes, it's going to break down and fade, like as far as colors and stuff, as quickly yeah. as it would as like an old car out in the woods. It's going to, it's going to retain its, its natural image longer yeah. so our, our yeah. hope our hope is that it just didn't get you know blown into a million pieces drive flying down an impact and if it did that there's a large enough chunk somewhere to look odd you know to say well that is either a massive birch stump or the airplane or you know what i mean something like yeah. that that's that's yeah. our hope anyway yeah, yeah which, i think what's hopeful is oh you're muted you're, you're muted we look at those other crashes. I think this is maybe what makes us more hopeful. The two that I showed on on Google Earth, those were fairly high speed impacts, and those airplanes were still relatively intact. Mm -hmm. So um, I I believe I remember hearing about that C one hundred and thirty crash. Can you talk a little bit? When did it crash? As opposed to when was it found? And I know you said that the airplane was shredded. Um, yeah, which, so um, so it crashed in uh, September 1976, and um, and it it just flew into the ground. There was really no cause for it. There was some light ground fog. Uh, the pilots were distracted from a pressurization issue. There were something like 28 radio communications to the tower at Wurtsmith um, in a, in a 20 minute flight, you know, so it was really, they were kind of focused on this thing that wasn't critical to the flying of that aircraft. Uh, and they flew it right into the ground, uh, according to the air force. Uh, it, the first responders arrived there within a couple of hours at that time. It was, well, even now it's still, it's still a pretty good hump through the woods and through the swamps. Um, but it took a couple hours to get guys in there and, and then they, uh, they took out the survivors and ultimately they put a two track in there with a bulldozer to get some of the critical components, engines, some of the avionics equipment, that sort of stuff out of there. But the vast majority of it, then they just left in the woods. 
and it's spread out over a swath about 1,200 feet long, uh, about 200 feet wide. And uh, when I That's mapped it out, you, you can see, you can see, okay, the starboard wingtip is here, and you know where it hit the trees first, and the cowling for the number one engine is here, and that kind of thing. And you can kind of see how it breaks down. Now, a good amount of it was scavenged and scrapped by by locals after the Air Force sort of abandoned it in the woods there. Um, hmm. And that's what that's what we do in in northern Michigan. You know, this is free aluminum for whatever needs or, or suits you. Um, so, and then some of it's been piled up uh, in recent years. Uh, I think it was in twenty sixteen. The was the 40th anniversary and uh, the five survivors came out to it and met with the uh, first responders that helped them get out of the woods there. So they all kind of hiked back to it with their families and wow. had a ceremony. They put a, a memorial sign up, that sort of thing. So. And what year was that powerful. found again? I'm sorry. What year was that found again? It was, uh, it was always known. So it was, you know, it was never. Oh, long. okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So. Hmm. Very interesting. But anyway, uh, on your point, that a lot of it is in the swamp, a lot of it that's buried in the water and, and the kind of swampy conditions. When you kind of pull it out a little bit, it still has the green paint, it still has serial numbers, it still has all of that kind of stuff on it. Some of the aluminum that's more weather exposed has been kind of shined down or, you know, there are lichens and things like that that grow on it. Uh, but for the most part, you're right, uh, because it's in that kind of environment, it's it's going to be there for a very long time. Aluminum kind of holds up very well uh, through time. Aluminum in the water now is in very poor condition because not because of the water, but because of the water chemistry since the invasive mussels started. And oh, wow. uh, back in the 60s and 70s, when scuba diving became popular in the Great Lakes, uh, some of these Navy aircraft that were lost off Chicago were recovered and they were put back into a flying status. And if you look at the aluminum skins on these aircraft now, that looks like Swiss cheese. And that's because the invasive quagga and zebra mussels are basically changing that water chemistry and make it really acidic and it's just eating up the aluminum so the mm. condition of those aircraft are not going to be like they were you know even a couple of decades ago and th this might not be relevant to our case but out of curiosity that would, would a plane uh do better like and say a great lake a freshwater lake as opposed to like a saltwater area yeah or salt? yeah absolutely so yeah salts the chlorides in, in in salt water obviously are very corrosive to metals yeah. Um, and, then, and then there are a lot of things in salt water and marine environments that like to eat organic materials, you know, whether it's wood or bones or things like that. Gotcha. And so that's often ingested. So generally speaking, the fresh cold water of the Great Lakes is a fantastic preservative. Now it's changed a bit because of this invasive muscle problem. Um, but we have submerged forests here uh, from when the glaciers retreated. 8,000 years ago that are inundated now. And you got tree stumps that are rooted in the lake bottom that are 8,000 years old and they're all over the place in the Great Lakes. And so the preservation is there and the, and the stuff can be there for a very, very long time. Uh, but aluminum is just not faring well. Um, the flip side of that is if it gets buried in sediments like this P39 air cobra that I'm working on, uh, the stuff that's buried in sand is shiny and new with a paint and you can read the serial numbers and the star insignia and all that sort of stuff is still intact if it's not exposed to the muscles. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's um, interesting. I know I like a lot of the people's pontoon boats and the docks and stuff that they pull out of the areas around here. Um, once they get those out of the water in the fall, the storm for the winter, that there's covered in those zebra mussels. Yeah. No, they're terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And quick like that. You know, we put mooring buoys in seasonally from usually around April, May to October or so, and the base of the mooring will have, you know, five, six inches of muscle coverage on mm -hmm. every, every year. So it's, wow. it's amazing how quick they populate and colonize. I cut my foot on one in Elk Lake two or three years ago, and it took at least three hours for it to stop bleeding. Yeah. Oh, they're nasty. It's got an anticoagulant and it makes it really hard to stop bleeding when you get cut by one. Yeah. They were like little knife blades, little razor blades and and, and then they got all kinds of nasties that are associated with them with PCBs and heavy metals and all kinds of bacteria problems. And you know, just, there's nothing good about them. So. Oh. Hey, one thing I wanted to ask you without uh, getting, to, you know, going crazy on details, on it, but um, it, when you were investigating, um, 
this uh, this case back when you were when you were or you still are or whatnot. Um, did you ever run across a, 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 a radio call from John Block to the Civil Air Patrol um, during his flight? Did you ever run across that or hear about that? No. We we stumbled across it in some uh, some documents that actually I think Ross uploaded to our shared folder that we have, um, and I believe I would imagine he probably got them from John. But there's a there's a there's a a section. It's like a sentence or a paragraph in something that was meant for like a news station to use for like like explaining the like a script almost. And it says okay. that and it says that the Civil Air Patrol out of Bay City. Um, received a what received a radio call, whatever that means, from John Block um, to to have a what was the call received at one thirty? Yeah, the call was received at one. Was received at one thirty to have a car ready for him at the airport when he got there, and that's yeah, that's pretty are. much and that's all it says. It doesn't say like it doesn't give any details about what was said or if he identified himself or how they know it was actually him or. So we're going to say who took the call, who wrote it down, nothing like that. It just says Civil Air Patrol received the call. So, I mean, right. we don't know how to take that, really. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I guess the first thing I would do is uh, figure out if that if the 150 had a radio in it. And it so did. A lot of, it did. Now, John some said it did. Have, some of them have receivers only and not transmitters at the time. And so did he have a full two-way communication system? For knowledge, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing about that call, if somebody received it at Lost Creek, you know, that would have been recorded in the notes when they were interviewed by the authorities. I, yeah, I don't you think, would think they would have not recorded that he called in and they got the call. Yeah, I was, I was, that's why I was confused because it said Bay City CAP talked about a call to Lost Creek from John. It's like, well, wait a minute. Well, how did, I don't know if it was intercepted by Bay City just because of his proximity to their receiver or how that was. So basically what, why I told you that is we're trying to get information on that to see if that's actually a viable thing that happened or if it's just something from back then. Possible. If, it's even, and if it is, it's nice to know because you know he was in the air at 1.30. Uh, you know, the you one can, thing about that call is that the time was way off. If he'd have left Liz, uh, McComb and went to Luzerne, we figured out that the time would have been is if he called in at 1 30 i think it was way off wasn't it patrick yeah like he would have already been there or something well speaking he would have been there by then yeah, yeah. It's only you know an hour and 50 minutes and that's mm -hmm. even going around the bay the way i had plotted it so yeah and then you know then it's like well okay did he end up in charlotte and then if you have him taking off from charlotte at the time they said well if he makes that call to Luzerne. Those radios weren't that powerful. I mean, it puts him south, just south of Saginaw at 1.30 when he made the call. Luzerne would have never received it. So there's just, there's still a lot of- But Bay, Bay City could have though, right? I mean, Bay City obviously would have been able to receive it. Yeah, Bay City could have. And the fact that they did receive it isn't surprising because yeah. those those outfits, they monitor air traffic uh, transmissions all the time. They're monitoring Unicom frequencies constantly. So the fact that they may have overheard it doesn't surprise me. Patrick, Gosh, have, have you been able to find any radar data from that time period out of wherever? I have not. Um, I don't know. You know, the fact that he didn't file a flight plan that sucks, but it's not uncommon back then. It's not even really that uncommon today. Right. Um, I suppose I could call flight service and see what they've got from that day, uh, but I don't. I, I don't know. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we're the whole thing of all. None of these times match up to nothing, um, really at all. I mean, do they, do they? I mean, the one. The one thing we're thinking is that, that for that Bay City one to maybe be possible, unless Lacombe's, uh, Macomb, when they said he left was the time on that was way off. But if, if he went to Charlotte, and that's the only way that that maybe could possibly work. But even then, when we was looking at it the other day, from Macomb to Charlotte, how long did that take, Tyler? Wasn't that it? Wasn't that even a little bit off? Yeah, we we don't know it because it, it said he left Macomb at eleven ten, right? And then he would and then he would have landed in Charlotte. They said at twelve, what is it, forty five or twelve fifty? 
It's something like I think, that. I think it was 12.50, wasn't it? Because then he left at 1.05. He was there for like 15 minutes or something. Yeah, 15 minutes. Pat, I think Patrick's muted. Or was not muted. No, that's, yeah, it was 12.50 yeah. when he got there, which, you know, from, that's a, a shot that's due west. Shouldn't take any more than 35, 40 minutes to get there. That would put him in Charlotte at 11.40-ish. Right. So mm -hmm. even that's off. <laughs> so 12 30 they saw him well now you're, you still got 50 missing minutes yeah the whole thing when we first heard about charlotte before we even knew about mike block and any of this stuff was i don't know if it was on a news report or something like that but they said he went to charlotte to refuel but then left because he couldn't get fuel because it was closed down then we started investigating a little bit more and then we found we finally started talking to mike and that's when it was the whole thing of well he landed in charlotte he was shocked now the whole thing about mike is it's really weird to us. We're trying to figure it out because still to this day, after all this time, he's still absolutely positive that they went to Charlotte. When we had him on here a couple of episodes ago, he was like basically crying when he was telling us the story about this. And if, and if he was just wanting to keep the search going at the time so they wouldn't stop, we're trying to figure out why is he still saying that 40 years later? That's right, yeah. So it's just, we're... It's, it's just a bunch I, of rabbit holes everywhere. I weighed it at, you know, 50-50. I mean, you know, you it's hard to prove either one. If we could find a state police interview that verifies they talk to these, then, then maybe. But it really doesn't factor in that much. I, I, I don't see. I, you know, on in Landon, I think you mentioned before the five-mile rule. I think he's muted right now, but... Uh, yeah. He's probably having some connection issues. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I can kind of hear. My Wi-Fi is bad, so you got to go off. Say that one more time. Uh, the five, the five-mile rule about uh, usually incidents happen within five miles or of the landing or takeoff uh, airport. Were you the one who, who mentioned that early on? Yeah, I think. We you, talked about uh, most most aviation accidents. Um, the percentage of them happen on that departure and arrival phase of flight. Um, so that's why we drew the rings where we did um, is a is a big piece of information. Obviously, it could have happened in um, a percentage of accidents and where they happen. That arrival and departure phase are crucial phases of flight. So it's like a basically a tendency of when aircrafts crash that that's the tendency of where they tend to crash. Not it's not a it's not a rule or it has to be hundred percent, but it's a tendency. Yeah. So. Well, and it's natural too, right? Because the when we when we talk about aircraft accidents, one of the things that they look at is what phase of flight was it in, right? And generally, accidents are going to happen upon landing or departure. They're generally not going to happen at cruise or during the cruise portion of flight so that it makes sense that it's going to be within five miles of the airport now percentage wise i'm not sure i think it's there's, probably, there's, there's more tasks it's going to be upwards of 80 percent i would think landon's also a pilot by the way wayne just in case <laughs> i don't know if anyone ever told you that or not but he's a pilot as well so yeah but then of course there are a million other things that can go wrong anywhere that are a complete crapshoot and right but i guess the ultimate thing is like i think uh, patrick or ross was saying that it, even if he did go to charlotte he's still just making that pizza pie wedge going right back to the lost creek it's a it's kind of narrowing you know so you might be 60 miles spread at, at the southern end of the search area but when you get to it you're going right to the same time right. so it gets narrow and narrower so that's kind of what we always said. Yeah, yeah, like his his destination was still the same. Yeah. 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 I think uh, I might push back on that a little bit. I think the thing that bugs that bugs me about Charlotte is that if he ended up in Charlotte and he was truly quote unquote shocked, um, as was reported, then it makes me think like, what's did he have an instrumentation problem? Did he not sync up his DG with his mag compass? And then furthermore, if he, if he blasts off out of Charlotte, could he in fact continued due west? 
I mean, was it was it really that much of a problem? Right. And so I, I'm, I don't know if we always end up in the same spot. That's mm -hmm. why Sherlock bothers me so much. Can you explain to him, too, Patrick, about what you were telling us the other day? If you don't sync that thing in every 15 minutes, like some of them was like every 15 minutes. But if you don't sync it before takeoff correctly, doesn't it just completely leave you in a direction you don't want to be going? I think it was Landon that might have. Go ahead, Ross. Or Patrick, sorry. Yeah. So there's. In small single engine airplanes like that, there's basically two ways to find your way. At least there were in 1977. There's a magnetic compass, and then there's another instrument called the directional gyro, which is basically like a flat compass wheel that's just planted on the panel. And so a magnetic compass generally spins like this. A directional gyro spins like that. So you can actually look at it. You have to make sure before you take off that those two instruments agree. The directional gyro is what they call a vacuum instrument. And so it runs on vacuum power. And it's a it's it's a gyro, right? It's just like a like a top or a dreidel, right? Like those those uh, metal things you wrap the string around and you pull it and it just kind of spins there on the uh, on your table or whatever. And if you touch it, right, it's gonna react 90 degrees to the left. So if you touch it straight in front of you, it's gonna go slinging off that way. The principle is exactly the same when you use an instrument like that. And so it's only going to read correctly in straight and level flight. So if you pitch up or you pitch down or you go left or right, you're going to get what they call precession, gyroscopic precession. And those instruments will often disagree. And so when we're teaching people to fly, especially when we get into cross country flying, we always have to say, make sure you sync up your DG. Cross-check your DG, make sure it reads the same as the mag compass. That's a surefire way to get lost and lost badly. Um, I've had to resync compasses before 25 or 30 degrees. And if you don't have a good handle on that, you're not watching it, you don't keep an eye on it, you can really have a, a bad day. And then it, it can also can it also become become uncalibrated during flight as well sometimes or is that not as common um yeah i mean it's it's never going to be exact right but during the cruise portion of flight it might precess a few degrees it wouldn't be enough to make them go uh one way and you know left instead of straight right correct the question that i have is whether he synced them up when he took off right because and that's a checklist item right so if he forgot to make sure those two instruments agree and he took off i you take off on a runway and you say okay i got to turn to a heading of what would it be approximately 330 to get to lost creek 340 well if your compass is off by 40 degrees well depending on which way it's off you know now you're going to 80 you're never going to get there so hopefully i mean he synced him up if not, he should have had the wherewithal to say, like, if he's looking at the roads and landmarks, like, this is not what I'm expecting to see. Usually that's when we would check and say, okay, is my, is my DG off? But it's, it's really hard to know uh, what happened there. But, but that, that's why Charlotte bothers me so much. Yeah. So according to John, he, he told me that, his dad would follow roads, right? And so that's kind of a common way of navigating around. And if your compass is a little whack, you know, 15 degrees off, and you start trekking, you figure you're going north and you're trekking, you think you're going up 75 and you're actually running this other highway. And that could have put him somewhere else. And, um, you know, without him paying attention to the other kind of telltale signs of which way he's going, you know, you're following a road, you're following a compass, they're both kind of in in cahoots with each other but you're wrong in both cases so right. yeah so i i don't know um is there any um do you know of any like service records or anything for that particular aircraft prior to that exist um the maintenance logs to my understanding were in the aircraft which is a, a no-no Right, you never keep the maintenance logs with the airplane. You always keep them out separately. Uh, I do. I may be able to get to the original equipment list 
of the aircraft. I can't talk too much about that here. Uh, I may have a way to get that information. Uh, so we'll see if that pans out. That would be helpful uh, in that we would know what model of DG was installed, what NAG compass was installed, um, as well as the radio equipment, right? Like, okay, well, what was the original, what was the original equipment that was installed with the airplane? Could it have been replaced or repaired? Sure. Um, but at least we'd have something to, to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, and when we, when we got these reports from like John and the, um, the Traverse city police, there's all kinds of sightings of airplanes that day all over Michigan. I mean, it, you know, all by like, um, yeah. Was that Rose Lake Tyler that we did? There was a lady. She, yeah, that's by Cadillac. Our, by Cadillac. She did actually report a big storm that popped up real quick and then went away real quick. But she did she like say a, it was like raining so bad? It's like a scattered thunderstorm dry? kind of a thing. You know, yeah. just a quick little downpour for 15 minutes or whatever. And then. Where she seen a plane circling over the lake and then started heading north. There was another one over by Empire. Um, there's reports like around 8, 9 o'clock at night of... I mean, it's just all right. There's like rabbit holes everywhere when you read these um, reports. Yeah, a lot. A lot of people heard loud bangs and crashes. On the fourth, yeah, Fourth yeah. of July. On the Fourth yeah, of July, can you imagine July. that? Hearing loud bangs on the Fourth of July. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I, I used to work on a, a sheriff's department dive rescue and recovery team, and you can get 400 witnesses to an accident and and every one of them's pointing like this yeah and they all have they all have a different story <laughs> and something that like a you know somebody falls off a boat and and goes into to an in one lake 200 feet offshore and it could take two days to find that person because you got you 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 start relying on these witness accounts and it, it leads you right away from where you should have been looking at you know the the evidence that's presenting itself so it's tough and when i'm working with these military crashes everybody and their brother comes out and says oh we saw we heard it we saw it we heard it. and it's like they weren't even in the state at the time you know it's like it's pretty amazing that i i don't know why people are like that i don't know if it's just their two minutes of fame in the newspaper kind of thing or or what yeah. it is but uh, what it ends up doing is really hurting the search effort because yep. you, you take a lot of resources off the, the primary trail and, and you kind of send them on these, these you know, wild. I don't trust people. any of them. Yeah. Any eyewitness yeah. stuff, I, I basically, you know, degrade it down to maybe 10% accuracy. Just, uh, yeah. you know, and, and Wayne, maybe you can tell us how many Griffin dives you've been on <laughs> with people who <laughs> keep yeah. discovering this, like 6,000 shipwrecks and they keep finding the same one. Yeah, I, you know, I've been on 32 now, I guess, 32 uh, Griffin uh, dives, and only two of them were actually shipwrecks. The rest of oh. them were rock piles and telephone poles and nothing really whatsoever, or pond net stakes or whatever. Um, you know, the only thing that's really refreshing about this, the, this block mystery is that the word the, the word UFOs never really come up in it, and it, and if you look at other aircraft that are missing around around the Great Lakes, and particularly in Lake Superior, some of the military aircraft, every one of those are UFO abductions, you know, accidents, hmm. and and uh, you know, for whatever reason, and again, it's just this this craziness that's kind of out there and kind of distracting from what evidence is really presenting itself. So. Um, I don't know. You know, this, this is a tough one. You would think that based on just the sheer population and uh, and development of lower peninsula Michigan in this particular track that it would have been found by now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can almost excuse an airplane like the one that was just found last summer up in the UP after I think it was what a 1980 something crash. And that's um, the one one of those Patrick was showing you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and so that's maybe okay, but like in Lower Peninsula, you would think there's just, just too many people around and there's just too much going on that, to stay hidden. But, you know, I, I deal with this kind of stuff every day, especially in the water. And, and there are, there are 600 foot steel freighters that are still missing out in the lakes. And you think, well, wait, well, just go out and find them. Why can't you find them? And it's like, well, it's a big damn lake and, you know, and it's, when you when you're looking at a 24 foot long airplane, you know that you can fit in your garage, 
and you take its wing off there it goes down to you know the size of a pup tent and, and it, there's not much to it and it can yeah. get massed pretty quickly so yeah one one thing i think about often is man this thing it probably landed it could have landed a river not landed but crashed or whatever in such a freak way in a freak place that's just so like you never drop something and it just lands weird and you go how i could do that again if i did it on purpose I wonder if it's just something like that where it's just it's in a, such a weird spot that it's either being missed, overlooked. It's not something, you know. Well, I saw a video the other day, and uh, Patrick turned me on to this uh, Facebook page, and it was a Cessna that went in near vertical, high speed, and I mean it went down so quick. And if there was a medical emergency and that thing nosedived into a swamp, I mean, the footprint would be so small and, you know, it so happens so fast, you know, so I think that's what we're thinking that the, there's the, the new technology is airborne mags or um, not, not airborne, but uh, drone mounted mags. So they're got them small enough. Now they can mount them on drones. And uh, there's a gentleman out of Alpina, Brian Dort. I'm not sure if you know, uh brian yeah good um good guy and he helped us search a swamp with his drone and he could run a search pattern into it program it in and it could do a search and rescue pattern mm -hmm. and he took high resolution uh images of the swamp that doug uh doug brooks told us about so i mean there's some technologies out there to access but i get I think even photography is going to be tough at this point if it's in a, if he if he no, hit hard into a nosedive, and I think yeah. he had to hit hard. He didn't land softly somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, we got to hope that the drone mounted mags can pick something up that small in a swamp area, I, and I don't know that much about them yet, or I haven't. Yeah. Not. You got to be, you got to have a pretty big hunk of metal and you have to have of iron and, and, and which means the engine on, on the, this particular aircraft. And you have to be pretty close to it, honestly. So, you know, we use pretty sophisticated magnetometers in the water to look for shipwrecks and airplanes and other things. And, and you can run them by, a, you know, some of these boilers on these 19th century craft are, you know, 20 feet long and 15 feet tall and that sort of thing. And unless you're within, you know, 150 feet of that thing, you're not going to pick that up. And so to pick up a, an airplane engine, you know, for a Cessna 150, it's the size of a lawnmower. Um, yeah. It, 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 you got to be, it's got to be really super sophisticated. It's got to be pretty clean. It's got to be near the surface. Probably, um, a shallow, so, probably a shallow, shallow body of water. Yeah. You know. But you're right, Ross, that one of the airplanes <laughs> that I'm working on, one of these Tuskegee airplanes, that two of them crashed, one in Lake Huron and one in the St. Clair River. The one in the St. Clair River dropped from about 1,500 feet straight in, went through the ice and embedded itself nose first in the lake bottom or in the river bottom in 30 feet of water. The entire airplane, which is about the same size as this one, you know, it's about a 32 foot wingspan, about a 24 foot long fuselage the whole site is maybe 10 feet by 10 feet that's it because it it's literally in the in the river bottom under 30 feet of water so you got to imagine that impact that that could do through the ice through that amount of water without being arrested before it impacted the bottom so plunking into a pretty soft you know gl glacial swamp in central michigan is yeah, that's the worst case scenario, I think, because that'll be the toughest one to find. Well, you didn't make me feel a whole lot better, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I could sit here and talk about this all day, guys, but go ahead, Ross. I, I, do, I do have a uh, question for Wayne. Are you aware of any other aircraft missing in the region, the Huron National Forest? Is there other uh, things out there? There's a there's a plane down by Glenny um, that was a uh, it was a bomber that was lost during the Second World War. Free French were flying it, uh, and it it's not lost. It's a known site, and there's not much left there. But it's a crater and, and some fragments of aluminum. Um, there were a couple of airplane crashes up here near near Alpena, including the KC-135 down by Ossini, but. I'm not aware of any, but my, honestly, my focus has always been in the water for the most part. 
and what could be in the water because of its archaeological potential. And so, you know, when I've got 1,100 potential submerged sites, I, the, the idea of trying to keep track of all the ones that crash on land is just impossible. I mean, there's just so many. Yeah. Um, so no, but I can look into that. I can, you know, I'll, I'll start putting a list together of anything that that went down in that area, or uh, or is still missing. I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, another thing that keeps up uh, comes to mind, like while we we're here looking in through all these woods and stuff for this plane, is the potential of coming across something else that's missing. Not just a plane, like a. Uh, people come up missing all the time. Like a, so I guess there's people that Ross was telling us that's come up missing it and their cars come up missing. You can't even find their car anymore. Yeah. So it's, yeah. You never know what you're going to run into out there. Like that suitcase. I mean, that's just weird. Yeah, it probably has nothing to do with anything, but it's just weird out there in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. One, one thing that me and Jeff discovered while we were uh, physically walking out there, we, we did, we, we searched a little, we found a little white blip in the middle of the woods, South of Curran, Michigan. Um, we walked about a, a mile, like 1.8 miles. It was just shy of two miles into the woods. And for the first maybe two, 300 yards, we were finding like some old tin cans. We found an uh, arrow from somebody's bow and arrow, or it might've been a crossbow arrow, actually, like a bolt. It was a crossbow bolt, yeah. Yeah, we found that. We, we were finding some 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 signs of human life. Uh, once we got in where we were walking for like 45 minutes, you didn't really see much of that anymore. And then the terrain went from flat to up down into a valley and up it was like the kind of thing where like once we got to where we were going our like thighs were on fire like you were like <laughs> like walking up and down so one thing that that was that we kind of thought was if a hunter like you, we think about hunters and and you know them going out and hunting they they don't want to uh overexert themselves any more than they have to they're wearing a lot of clothes they're on a time limit you know they can't they can't be they, they're not going to walk two miles in the woods up and down hills I mean, unless they like seen a 15 point buck or some somewhere that they just have to get or whatever. But generally speaking, they're not going to do that. So that's kind of one thing that gave us hope is that there are there's not a lot, but there still is some parts of the woods here, even in the lower peninsula that we think have the potential to, to hide something um, just because of the way they're laid out. You know, just all the right factors where people just don't really want to go there or just have been deterred from going there. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot, but we're hoping it's, it's, it's at least enough to hide a plane, hopefully. So. Yeah. 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 As far as deer hunters and stuff, you know, yeah. I think that's the best approach is just to, you know, you're going to have to go county by county. You're going to have to make everybody in that county aware that there's a missing airplane potentially in their backyard somewhere. And uh, so that people keep their eyes and ears open. You got to talk to every uh, DNR forester that you can come across every, you know, all those guys that are in the woods regularly. Um, just to kind of keep the lookout and you know and somebody might click and you know i talked to there's a shipwreck down in harrisville not that this has anything to do with it but it's just human observation um that when the water levels were way lower than they are today about seven years ago they were five six feet lower than they are now mm. um and there's a shipwreck that just sort of popped itself out on a big one a, almost a 200 foot propeller that's sitting in harrisville harbor and the harbor master that had worked there for the last 40 years uh, had seen the wood there, but always thought that was old fragments of the dock, you know, pieces of the dock. And here he is literally sit, his office is right on top of this historic shipwreck site. He had no idea that it was a shipwreck there. And so there's a, a good possibility again, that when you're walking through the woods and you know that, you know, that junk pile that's over there that I've been seeing every year when I go deer hunting. And it's a big hunk of you know aluminum from somebody's old deer blind, and lo and behold, it, it turns out to be an aircraft if you go look at it carefully. So, wow. um, you, you just don't know. That's why Ross, I I think the Griffin may have been found, you know, already and and just misidentified as some slab of shipwreck that's laying up on a beach somewhere. But like who who knows, you know, because they're so often misidentified. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, did you say that there's a, or maybe Ross was telling me there's a planned survey of Saginaw Bay, is it next year? We've been doing, uh, I've been doing a lot of survey kind of on the, on the mouth of the bay. And then there's an organization within NOAA called the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory 
that are based out of Ann Arbor. And they do all of the data buoys and other kinds of things. And they do a lot of biological studies. And they've been doing a lot of zebra mussel and quagga mussel kind of uh, surveys around the um, Charity Islands and all the way into the lower basin of Saginaw Bay. And some of the tools that they use for survey are size scan sonars and, and they're looking for habitat and, and other kinds of things. There's some talk about doing reef restoration for uh, lake fish uh, spawning for lake trout and white fish and that sort of stuff. Um, but when they're collecting that data, the, very often they could come across, you know, these kinds of things. Again, it's uh, you can collect it and as a non-archaeologist looking for habitat, you may not readily identify it or even care if there's some kind of a linear feature or some kind of clearly cultural feature and it may just sort of get checked off the list. But we're getting more and more kind of integrated with, you know, other scientists that are working around the lake so that we can share the information and we can share it more and, and interpret it more effectively, you know, using different disciplines coming in at it. So we had a, a big survey up in the Straits over the last three years that NOAA Coast Survey, the guys that do all the charting. Um, and they found a, a couple of dozen what appear to be new discoveries of shipwrecks or pieces and parts of shipwrecks. Uh, and I say new only because I didn't know about them. And it doesn't mean that the local dive population or community doesn't know about them. Um, but as soon as NOAA started charting these wreck sites, uh, all of the, a lot of the shipwreck hunters there started discovering them. And so they're literally just driving up to the coordinates that are now on the maps and making these fantastic discoveries. And Ross is shaking his head, so he knows what I'm talking about. But oh, yeah. um, so it's just, it's a little crazy, but uh, again, it's, there's, there's a lot of science going on. It's just a matter of who's interpreting that data and what you're looking for. And a biologist might not be looking specifically for an airplane or a shipwreck or whatever so you think it would make sense to at least make those participants aware yep. of what yeah about? yeah absolutely yeah so you have questions on what the best way to do that would be yeah well uh you know so like i do uh you know i work with uh, usgs for example they do a lot of bottom trolling uh, activities and I kind of gave them a standard protocol well if you if you bring your nets up and there is a timber in it uh, you know, who to contact, how to identify it, kind of, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I'm doing the same thing with this beach wreckage initiative with the changing shorelines uh, and, and the pandemic. A lot more people are out on the beaches in the last couple of winters than there have been in, in normal years. And a lot of uh, pieces and parts of shipwrecks are being found. And sometimes they're docks and cribs and other things, but a lot of times they're shipwrecks. And so I kind of created a form that's available on a whole bunch of different websites that you can get. You can go in and do sort of a citizen scientist approach. You can measure it and draw it and photograph it and that sort of thing. So I don't want it collected. There's just too much stuff to be collected, um, but I want to be aware of it, where it is, what it is, that kind of thing. And and maybe we can do the same kind of thing with you know this county by county search. You know, it just got it's got to get people aware. I mean, the chances are pretty good if you look at the population between. Uh, Detroit and, and Mayo, uh, and you ask anybody, I guarantee nobody knows about this story. Nobody. Mm -hmm. I mean, 0% of the population knows about it. And so the more public awareness that you get, you know, get, get it fresh in their minds again, especially in the high priority areas that you're narrowing your search down to. So the more eyes and out, ears that are out there, the, the more likely you're going to find something. Yeah, what, what I've been doing when we go out and do some of these, we've done a couple searches, but like, for example, we did that one in Curran, um, I recorded the whole thing and, and threw it on our, our YouTube. And then but what I do is I also share it to our Facebook page. And then I, I boost it through Facebook. I put, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 bucks, 60 bucks, whatever behind it. And I can boost it in a certain zip code. So I can boost it right in Curran and Mayo. So they are the ones that Facebook is feeding this video to. So that's kind of some of the mm -hmm. stuff that we've been trying to do just to spread awareness on it and, and try to get people to be involved with it in any way shape or form we get some comments and stuff yeah on videos people saying hey <clears throat> that area is hunted a lot but where you guys should check might be here or yeah something like yeah that. so a couple that's, names that's, of the swamps yeah different names of swamps that we never heard of and different weird stories like i heard a dnr plane went down over in this area and things like that so a lot of yeah. it's probably trivial but it's it's good to have somebody yep. else thinking about holy crap there's an airplane missing over here somewhere you know it's yeah. just 
Yeah, and a lot of times when they boost them, it's for like a week, I think. And what, how many interaction or uh, people does it reach usually? Like three thousand or something like that. That's what it says. I don't know what that really means, but I, I, as far you know, I don't know if that means people just scroll past or actually sit there and look at yeah. it or watch the video. But it's if any, anything's better than nothing with this case because it's like mm -hmm. I, I never knew about it until we just started doing this like six months ago, and I'm like, there's an airplane missing in Michigan. Yeah, like, uh, that like from the '70s and nobody's found it. That doesn't. How is that possible? You know, it kind of puzzles you. So I, I think your best, your your biggest resource, and I don't know if you tapped into it yet or not, are DNR foresters. So I think uh, I would bet that they spend more time in the woods than any other member of the population, including deer hunters. And and they, you know, deer hunter, I, all the guys I know hunt go to their own camps, their own mm -hmm. shooting lanes. They're, they've got that little 100 foot by 200 foot area of the earth, and that's it. You know, they're not, they're not, like you said, they're not tracking deer three miles into the woods and they're not mm -hmm. going to bring a carcass all the way back like that, especially in pre-quad days. Right. So they're going to be hunting in very, you know, familiar areas. DNR foresters, especially, uh, they're, they're in the woods for all kinds of reasons. And a lot of it is timber sales and prescribed cuts and prescribed burns and all these kinds of things. So they know the woods well, they really do. And, um, and they know where they haven't been in the woods and that's maybe mm -hmm. more important. So uh, the DNR has got a big facility up in the Gaylord area and maybe, you know, you can, you can go up there and kind of do, put together a little educational video or something, an awareness video for them. That's so a good thought. Kinda, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and I'll be happy to kind of help facilitate that. So those are the guys that found the crash in the UP. Yeah. yeah the, the one by Castle Rock, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a, a, they were doing a forestry survey of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a land survey of... something. Yeah. And then bear hunters actually found the other one. Yeah. Which, and the only guys that we, that would really go that far into the woods is, you know, like coon hunters or anybody running bear or anything because they're running the dogs. And a lot of times when those dogs are on something, they're not going to listen to you. So you got to get out, get your little antenna out, track them down, go in there, find them, you know, what whatever they got treated up. So sometimes that can take you two miles into the woods, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's the only reason that that one that other one was found. Yeah. So Wayne, I see that you're on Facebook. Um, we'd like to invite you to our private um, John Block Missing Sus group if you're interested. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, generally, the posts uh, come from Not Forgotten saying, "Hey, we have a new video." Uh, it's not spammy. The only people that can post to that group are the people on this call. Um, so you don't have to worry about errant stuff flying through your newsfeed and whatnot, but um, send you a friend request, but we'd love to have you as part of that if you'd like. Yeah, yeah basically we just post things like if we've done any more Freedom of Information Acts, any searches that, we're, that are coming up next, any important targets that we see that we're gonna search soon, just stuff like that, just stuff to yeah. do with the case. Cool. Great. Well, oh. we thank you coming out. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, very, very yeah, helpful. Yeah, thanks a lot, Wayne. Everything oh, we yeah, can help great. with, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, I could, I, I'll, I'll start dumping information. I mean, again, I don't have a lot that you guys probably haven't seen. You know, I've got tons of newspaper transcriptions. I've got a lot of weather data. You know, I've got, you know, basic stuff like that. But this this really kind of gets me going again and wants me to dig deeper and see what I can find. And, and, uh, and I, it, and if we can put together, if you have together something, just a short, you know, a brief four minute video or whatever on the overall project, then we can start sharing that and pushing that through DNR and get all the foresters to take a look at it, get all the guys that, uh, yeah, a lot of these small town municipalities now got, they got all kinds of drones and, you know, other mm -hmm. kinds of things for search and rescue operations and, you know, and they're getting pretty savvy with the use of it. You got these power line crews that are running drones up and down for, uh, you know, line surveys and that kind of thing. And I, so there's a lot of incredible amount of technology now that's out and about. And it's yeah, just that's a great thing. idea with that yeah, four minute video. We could run something really good with that. Just yeah. I think it'd be real easy to make a video, just a quick little four minute or even a two, three minute yeah. synopsis of the case and then have a little two minute video of us talking, saying this is what we're looking to help on. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your help. Appreciate everything you're doing and whatnot. And as far as what, uh, you, Wayne, even just having somebody where if we have a weird question about like a magnetometer or just something weird like that, that we don't really answer to, just having you as a resource to be able to ask 
is, yep. you know, is help is more help than, mm-hmm. than we could ask for. So anything you can definitely help with is, is better than nothing for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Now this is cool. Great effort. I, I mean, I think you have, uh, like you said, newspaper articles and things and stuff. We have an entire share drive full of materials. Yeah. If you'd like access to that. I'm happy to give you the private share link. Okay. Yeah. It's, and I can dump all my, and again, I don't have a lot of stuff on this, but you know, maybe there's, there's some little clue that, that, you know, is helpful. So. Yeah, it's a lot of information there from John and Jenny and Ross and then the FOIA stuff from Traverse City. And then when I get information back from the Michigan State Police, and I also sent out a FOIA request to the Scott Airfield Base, uh, the Air Force yeah. there, because they are who control the CAP. So I'm hoping that they might have some information on that call or just anything that could help us in relation to that. So any of that information, I'll make sure to put in there yep. as well. And then we called, uh, we figured out that the Civil Air Patrol in Bay City was at, at that uh, James Clemens Airport. Then they actually moved to Saginaw. Uh, we called them the other day, so we're gonna. What is today? We didn't Wednesday. call Saginaw. We called Bay City, but they. Well, we called Bay City, but we're gonna yeah. be calling Saginaw to see if they they can point us in the right direction, mm-hmm. and see what we can learn from them guys. That's supposedly where this call came in, so I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah, that's interesting to see if that really shakes down or not. Right. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate it a lot, and so much for your time. Oh yeah, sure thing. Anytime, but let me know when you want to get together again and, and uh, chat. I got all I got all kinds of time right now. So. Great, awesome. Hey, Landon, it's nice seeing you in high definition too. I see this is the most the best resolution I've ever seen you in. I apologize, guys. My Wi-Fi found my phone works much better. I heard everything. It, your phone works great. <laughs> yeah, you look good. You got the best video right now. Wayne, it's nice to finally meet you. <laughs> same, same. Thank all you, right, guys. Your- we'll see you guys. All right, right, gentlemen, have a good night. Thank you. See you later. Okay, yep, bye-bye.